They wonder why their children of five years old have to read graphically sexually explicit books in nurseries. These, these are questions that don't have an answer because they're inspired by a myth. And that myth is the myth of progress. Theonerds.net On this episode of Theonerds, journalist Frank Wright articulates the modern myth of progress and the dangerous derangements that flawed Enlightenment thinking has wrought on modern society through the manifestation of technocratic managerialism. The contradiction of Enlightenment thinking, satanic science, humanity as a managerial problem, technological behavioral modification, manufacturing mental illness, moral inversion, and more is covered in this episode. Timestamps are in the show notes with relevant references. Consider joining the Theonodes email list for more interviews like this. Let's begin. One thing I want to get into, and I think it's really important on this topic of technocracy and this control of human behavior, is this idea that we are, in fact, dealing with something that is fundamentally spiritual. And I think this is often overlooked within a lot of journalists who are very competent in exposing what is happening around us, the likes of James Corbett and the Whitney Webbs, a lot of these individuals who are, who are very competent. But I, I always feel like their solutions fall flat because they essentially are responding to enlightenment ideals with more enlightenment ideals. This is how we got here. We got, we got here because of a fundamental belief of humanity, a worldview problem. And their solutions are always more of that problem. It's almost like throwing gasoline on a fire. I don't know if you want to speak into that. Have, is that something that you've noticed as well? Well, yes, it is. And this is no, this is no error, as it were. This, is, this isn't an accident. Of, um, this is a feature of enlightenment thought. The problem that we are faced with and that our elites are faced with is that everything that flows from the Enlightenment, its ideas of liberation and that humanity can emancipate itself, ultimately resolve into paradoxes. That's the reason why you notice that these so-called solutions, in fact, resemble a serpent eating its own tail. You cannot escape this system by using its own machinery. The basis of Enlightenment thought is the fundamental idea that man can be the instrument of his own salvation, that through his reason and thereby his clever machines, what we call technology, he can replace God and become quasi-divine himself and liberate himself from what's been described as the superstitions of the past. Unfortunately, this itself is a superstition, as has been constantly mentioned elsewhere, including by the Frankfurt School, the Enlightenment is a deception. It is misleading. For different reasons, Adorno and Horkheimer described the Enlightenment uh, in German, the Aufklärung, which also means the explanation. So the Enlightenment was an attempt to explain the world without God. What it does is it resolves into paradox. There are several obvious paradoxes today that Enlightenment uh, reason has led us to. Through liberalism, which John Gray describes as the attempt to continue Christianity without Christ, he makes a very good argument for that, and I won't repeat it here. He's not the men are from Mars, women are from Venus, John Gray, I would note but the former professor for European thought at the London School of Economics. So in his book, Seven Types of Atheism, he shows you how liberalism is an attempt to abandon God and yet continue Christianity without Christ. This is obviously going to lead to paradox, but it doesn't just lead to paradox. It leads to a reliance upon pure belief. It leads to a reliance on fantasy. And one of those fantasies that Gray identifies is progress. What he means by this, that progress is a delusion, is that the idea that humanity inexorably, that's to say, just as a function of time, improves intellectually and morally as a whole, is a myth. There is no mechanism by which this can happen, and yet this underpins the entire idea of Enlightenment progress. The reason why it resolves into paradox, legally it resolves into paradox right now, as Patrick Deneen pointed out in his book Why Liberalism Failed, is that one obvious attempt is the legal paradox of attempting to prioritise the rights of aggressively marketed minorities against, naturally against, the rights of majority that don't share their identities or their platform. This is a legal paradox of liberalism. Now, what that means practically is, if you do not belong to a protected group, you will not enjoy their legal privileges. Liberalism has no answer to the priority of rights that itself creates because it promotes extreme individualism as the basis of a free society. As these individuals become more extreme and organise themselves into more extremist platforms, making yet more niche demands, the priority of their rights naturally disadvantages the rights of people outside that small group. This is a legal paradox. There are logical paradoxes that cannot be resolved. In the early 20th century, the most famous philosopher in the English language was Alfred J. Ayer. He was a lifelong atheist right up until the end when the doctor that attended his deathbed 
near a near-death experience that he experienced due to having swallowed a piece of salmon, if I remember, nearly choked to death. The doctor who attended his deathbed said that on awakening from this, in hospital, Ayer claimed to have met a divine being and said that he would have to rewrite all his books that refuted the existence of God in the light of this experience. He refused to mention it later, but his wife did say that he was much changed by this and became very much a close friend of a Jesuit priest towards the end of his life. So he had profoundly altered his character. Nevertheless, Ayer's attempt in his book Language, Truth and Logic in the 1930s was to show that reason could explain the world completely by the use of verifiable statements. Yet this is a statement itself that couldn't be verified. Once this was noticed, his work was discredited. Later on, a bloke called Karl Popper, another kind of positivist, so, which is the idea that truth can be reduced to logical statements. This, this man wrote a book called The Open Society and Its Enemies, whose title inspired George Soros to name his Open Society Foundation in its honour. Now, Popper's principle was kind of the opposite, where he said that things can be known to be true if they're falsifiable. But his own statement isn't falsifiable, and therefore his own position cannot be defended by the premise of his own logic. These two examples show attempts in the 20th century to bring enlightenment reason to a conclusion suggested by Auguste Comte in the French Revolutionary period. He was the, one of the earliest positivists, if not the first, a man who wished to reduce all, tr all truth to language and logic. <laughs> A materialist. And what he said was, is that once the truth has been established by people such as the Committee for Public Safety, people like Robespierre and Danton and Marat, the murderers of the revolution, then free speech can be abolished because it would be a threat to the truth. All it would be would be a distraction from the truth of a utopian ideology. Now, John Gray, in his book Seven Types of Atheism, traces the development of this strand of thought from ideas such as August Comte and the Enlightenment to the present day showing that they are the ideas of a dangerous bunch of utopians who, with their exclusive claims on a paradise that is yet to be revealed, their exclusive claims on a product that does not exist, that yet they aggressively market, they say that these, these claims require the defence of prohibition, the prohibition of the freedom of speech and of ideas, and the prohibition of anything that may challenge this notion. So does this sound like uh, an enlightenment? It certainly sounds like an explanation for something. The explanation for something is the reduction of man to a mechanical reality. Now, the attempt to explain the world in logic has been abandoned. The interest in philosophy has moved to ethics, and the ethics that we have nowadays is the ethics of preference, and it's probably best exampled in the work of Peter Singer. Now, Peter Singer is a bioethicist whose work has been adduced in court in, in problems about the beginning and end of life, if you like about the murder of the pre-born and the removal of life support for people who were suffering from brain death, such as the case of Anthony Bland following the Hillsborough disaster. Now, Peter Singer maintains that human beings do not achieve personhood until the age of five. So it's all right to kill them. And he says also the pigs have more right to life <coughs> than a neonate like a newborn or an unborn child or indeed your three-year-old daughter. So these, these are the ethics of preference utilitarianism. And what that basically says is, is that there isn't any absolute moral good, except for what the majority of people prefer to do. Now, when you have a moral system like this, it becomes imperative to shape people's opinions, because if you can shape their opinions, you can then shape what is morally acceptable. And this explains the reversal of the mass of opinion about such beliefs as the murder of the unborn, which has now become not just acceptable, but celebrated as, as the pinnacle of the very sort of emancipation that the Enlightenment promised. This is the nature of progress. In, I would say it's anti-life, it's anti-God, and it's anti-human in its essence. I had an abortion two years ago and I don't regret it at all. They yanked the fetus out of my uterus. They yanked the fetus out of my uterus and I'm so happy. Okay. I'm so grateful. Okay. And I'm a professor at this university. Okay. And I make more money than you. Okay. But the attempts to, do, to, to, to reduce life to a kind of mechanistic explanation which is, again, a result of the Enlightenment, also saw an expression in communism. Now, I would argue that the 20th century was a period in which we saw three great experiments in what I, I call the religion of man. The first, second and third religions of man were communism, fascism and liberalism. Now, under the communist system, there were attempts made to achieve an absolute power that simply weren't possible under fascism because it lasted a lot longer. Interestingly enough, it's in the work of Ted Kaczynski, uh, a man who's 
policy of mailing explosives through uh, to people that he doesn't know, I would never endorse. I do not endorse the murder of anonymous people for the furtherance of any political program. I'd like to point that out in case there's any confusion. But nonetheless, Kaczynski's book, Anti-Tech Revolution, describes not just uh, an excellent critique of the belief that technology can somehow provide mankind's salvation, but also the limits of power. So the 20th century showed the limits of logic and the limits of power, because as Kaczynski says, Stalin himself did not enjoy the absolute power that people fantasize about capturing. He also adduces a conversation between F.W. de Klerk of South Africa and Nelson Mandela, where Mandela indicates some problem that he says de Klerk should solve by the use of the police. And de Klerk says to him, do you imagine that I enjoy absolute power? When you have it yourself, you realize that that's a fantasy. So what Kaczynski is saying is, is that revolutionaries, utopians especially, people who imagine and try and advertise a better future through some form of revolution, they all dream of seizing absolute power and exercising it. But absolute power has never proven to be practically possible, even in the most extreme dictatorships in human history, which I would argue took place in the 20th century. And some would agree with me that the most successful experiment in that was the East German Stasi state, where a third of adults at some point in their lives were actually working for the secret police, children informed on their families after dindings. Nevertheless, in East Germany, as was discovered by um, German Western uh, intelligence, there existed many jokes about the communist system. They couldn't abolish them. I mean, you know, for example, one was quite common. It said, well, if communism comes to the Sahara, the next week they'll announce a shortage of sand. So the, 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 the cynicism about the promises of the so-called perfect system of communism was expressed in humour and they couldn't extinguish it. And also, as Kaczynski points out, Stalin was at the mercy of his advisers. The lesson for political power there from the 20th century is the same for the lesson for the limits of logic. There's a limit to it and you can't achieve absolute power. So the reason why we have an emerging technocratic managerialism is that the belief in technology is the belief that this circle can be squared by the use of machines and computing, that we can avoid these limitations of human reason and human activity, that we can achieve absolute power and a perfect machine-like system if we replace ourselves with computers. How familiar are you with the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis? I'm not very familiar with that. It's an interesting read because it was written between 1938 and 1945, sort of the height of this technocratic idealism. And what he really sets forth is this idea of scientists who've adopted scientism, who understand its limitations, and who eventually seek enlightenment through the occult and occult practices. And it sort of transitions between scientism and then leads to, essentially, the protagonist becomes a demoniac and is... Um, <laughs> Funny that. Himself and Tolkien were certainly onto something in terms of where this leads to. You know, in Lord of the Rings, we have yeah. uh, the Nazgul, which are these uh, ring wraiths who have been completely given over to covetousness and who lust after the, the one ring. Which is a totem for absolute power. Yes. Well, I liken them to the so-called technocrats that are meeting at Davos every year. <laughs> you know, these people who are just controlled by their lusts. And then we have the Eye of Sauron, Sauron, this kind of mass surveillance system that is trying to peer and look at everything. So these these men certainly understood. They, I think they used fantasy as a way to warn people of what they believe was coming. They're very interesting novels, and I find them very useful because they... These types of things are hard to censor because they are parables, essentially. So this idea of trying to control people and silence people, well, you can't kill a story. You know? And I think these are very powerful means of communicating these ideas, particularly in this age where things are, are so censored and, and shut down. Now, one thing I, I want to come, come to quickly is you recently wrote an article, and I'll, I'll quote you, said, good ideas are paid for with courage. And I do think that there is a need for this increase in courage, increase in morals, I just want to quickly read to you from The Art of War. I think this is just worth mentioning. This is the, the beginning of The Art of War. It says, the Art of War then is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are, number one, the moral law. So he opens up by saying the moral law is one of the most important things that the military need to comprehend in order to be successful, um, to have successful campaigns. He goes on in point six, he says, the moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler, so they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. 
if Sun Tzu in the Art of War is saying that the basis of a strong army is a moral people who are willing to lay down their lives to protect those whom they love, well, then doesn't it make sense that if you want to destroy humanity, that your chief objective would be to reduce the moral character of the population so that they are easier to control? In response to the idea of a binding moral principle behind any effective army, I would adduce a meme. And the meme that I have in mind is, uh, gentlemen, today I present our new banner, right? And it's the rainbow flag. And all the little soldiers underneath it say, I hope we lose. Uh, that, that, that's what's happening to the British Army and to the US Army. Mm -hmm. The most inexplicable part of your story is not that a bunch of LGBTQ2+, they name gets longer by the minute, um, that these activists tried to cancel you over reposting a quote which many would agree with, certainly from a biological sex point of view. The most scandalous part of this is that the army went along with this, launched a formal investigation into you, you know, told you it was specifically about the fact you'd shared this post, this other person's opinion, you had shared it. That seems to me extraordinary, that the British army would do this to somebody like you. It makes you wonder who is running the army. Mm. Is it the chief of the general staff or is it Stonewall? Mm. Every year, so I've been a commanding officer, it's a great privilege for the last five years, um, two as a half colonel and, and three as a full colonel. And um, every year as a commanding officer, we would stand in front of our, our troops and we would talk about the values and standards of the army, mm. moral courage, most importantly, moral courage, doing the right thing, even when sometimes it's difficult um, around you. And that's what really gets me a little bit on this. Why did someone else higher up the chain not have the moral courage to mm. say, actually, most of this complaint is absolutely vexatious? So you know, the unifying moral principle is actually immoral. Yes. And, and it's not only immoral from the point of view of fundamentalist bigots like ourselves, but it's also demoralizing to the average infantry soldier who has joined for the purpose of killing his nation's enemies. He hasn't joined for the purpose of promoting a rainbow agenda. I mean, as for your mention of fantasy and the occult, it's important to note that 20th century occultism described itself, in fact, rebranded re itself as scientific illuminism. So that's the nature of the penetration of science into fantasy, if you like. There's another note to make about what you said about Davos. Now, Davos was chosen by Klaus Schwab because of his reading of Thomas Mann's book, The Magic Mountain. I have to read Thomas Mann because I'm writing about Faust. I've read Thomas Mann before and I regret every minute of it. But nonetheless, I have read it so you don't have to, right? <laughs> the Magic Mountain, it takes place in a sanatorium where the musings of people who are avowedly sexually permissive uh, and, and mentally capricious so mentally and morally weak people who are physically ill, their, their fantasies, their caprices, the, the, the notions they entertain, their flights of occult fantasy, they believe that they have some kind of connection to broader cultural events, that there's some, that there's some self-appointed mountain-dwelling elite that breathes a cleaner air, that knows better than you, and whose personal realm of private fantasy and desire shapes the world. Why do you think this appeals to a man who dresses like a James Bond villain? The role of fantasy in the technocratic project cannot be overstated, and it really drives to the heart of the project. It is a fantasy wrapped in scientism. The technology is not the guiding principle. The technology is merely the instrument by which certain elites wish to achieve their own fantasies of power, and not just power, political power, but the power over life and death for themselves and for others, and the power, a, a quasi-godlike power, which is adduced in the work of people like Martin Rothblatt, who's one of the earliest Tranningtons to exist. He attempted to pass himself off as a woman in the 1990s. He's a billionaire, he's the owner of Sirius Radio in the United States, and he's created a foundation called the Terrasen Foundation, which is what he described as a trans religion. It has four principles, and one of them is technology is God. He believes that being transgender is, is a sign of release or emancipation from the human condition, and that it is, if not a necessary step, then a very powerful one towards a post-human future that he imagines. He's made an animatronic model of his wife. What movies would you like to talk about? My favorite movie is Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan.
You like the Wrath of Khan? I'm not sure. Uh, it's a very crude approximation of humanity. But if you want a vision of the future that's imagined by these people, imagine a, a, a crudely affected animatronic head reading its own Twitter feed forever. It's, it's the kind of utopia that would only appeal to people who fear death because there'll be no one left to curate their Instagram. What, what, what I'm saying in a humorous way is that, that the post-human future, that these technocrats, inspired by the fantasies of people like Ray Kurzweil, who believes that technology can confer immortality, the post-human future is one that is unworthy of being lived by anyone who places any value on human life. Everything that's worthwhile in human life, beauty, truth, God, morality, life itself, is going to be annihilated to produce this perfect future. Human input is seen as a glitch in the system. This is the reason why your life often resembles being held in a perpetual automated telephone queue. Because it is. Because corporate customer service, which is the kind of managerialist lexical protocol that excludes human input deliberately, customer service views you as a kind of disease attempting to penetrate the corporate body. It isolates and neutralizes your so-called complaint which is probably a reasonable objection to be treated in an inhumane manner. The inhumane manner of treatment is intentional. It is a machine. Now, the reason why society is a machine is because machinery, technological refinement of managerial processes, or as it were, the attempt to produce a standardised result in both humanity and systems of administration, this is the goal of technocratic managerialism. What it seeks to do is replace everything with itself. And everything human and everything beautiful and everything true and everything good is simply an impediment to this imagined utopian perfection, which is a fantasy. Whether you are a social or fiscal conservative, a Marxist-Leninist, whether you're a fundamentalist Catholic, a Muslim, whatever you are in life, you are simply an impediment to the machine-like perfection that is imagined by the technocrats. Everything that is not itself is seen as a form of disease to be vaccinated away. Humanity itself is a limitation. So the technocratic society is the answer to the idea that man's limitations in reason and in action can be broken. He can emancipate himself from these limitations by the use of technology. This is a continuity of the enlightenment promise of liberalism because the liberal idea is basically the idea that man can be emancipated by the removal of all restraint if he is de-restricted in his fantasies and desires, he becomes totally free. And machinery is the means by which we are supposed to do this. But it comes at the expense of the annihilation of everything that is human. I would argue it's not liberation, it's annihilation. It's, it's interesting. There's a documentary that the Technocracy Inc. produced, which was called Operation Columbia. And then it, you'll notice that everything is grey. Their outfits are gray, their cars are gray, their planes are gray. And they even, they, at one point, they even de depict a car being sprayed and saying, oh, the latest car getting sprayed with technocracy gray. If you are driving a non-official car, let's give it a new coat of technocracy gray. The gray is an in interesting color because it's the fusion of black and white is how you get, get gray. And I almost feel like the white will symbolize scientism and the black. So the scientist is, is symbolized by the white. And then the the wizard and, and his black garbs is 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 the black, and so you have this amalgamation of the white and black forming the, the technocracy gray. I don't know if that was intentional, but it it certainly is an underlying element of the entire movement. In fact, Howard Scott, in an interview with a a student that would kind of sprung up in the nineteen sixties, uh, the student asks asks him how many members are in Technocracy Inc. This te technocracy movement. It's essentially a secret society. How many members do you have now? Well, you never make any statement on membership. Mm -hmm. Never have, never will. And not in, mm -hmm. just the same as when we introduce anybody on the platform. We do not engage in the eulogy of who he or she is. Just that they're an officer or director or so on of technocracy. Mm -hmm. Prior to hearing a stirring message from Rio McCaslin in the Masonic Temple, while outside, the big eye was again scanning the skies. The Brotherhood of Efficiency. The Freemasonry of Science. Well, Elon Musk's dad was a, a technocrat. Yes. I mean, you know, pe people overlook that, but that's that's his his lineage. I mean, the the thing is, is that it's very much it's important to understand 
the, the product in which technocracy is interested is humanity itself. Now, if, if, if people are interested in Burnham, because Burnham's work was like a blueprint for what we inhabit today. The managerial revolution was written in 1940. And what he went on about was the model of governance that was replacing both capitalism and socialism. And this, he said, was a kind of managerialism, which is where managers become very powerful. They control the resources and the political decisions. And they're unelected, so you can't get rid of them. And they develop their own practices and they're constantly refining them to become more efficient. But they're not accountable. And they, so far, you know, they are proximate. They're everywhere, but they're also distant because you can't really repel them in any way. You, you, you can't vote them out. Now, if you want an introduction to it, George Orwell's essay, which is, um, which is called Second Thoughts on James Burnham, is a brilliant primer upon this. He talks about some of the shortcomings of Burnham's failed political forecasting. You should never really try and read the political weather, you know. I mean, there, there's a lesson from Burnham. But broadly speaking, he got it right. He got it right that managerialism would supplant government power, mm -hmm. that it would become a kind of... And he also said something interesting about the world. He said the world would resolve into these several um, regional power blocks. I mean, with the emergence of BRICS uh, to counter what you might call um, the gay empire or the empire of lies. Gayocracy. Yes, yes, or, or, or what you like call the regime, you know, against Western technocratic managerialism, there's a form of kind of classical managerialism in, in expanded by China and Russia and now Saudi Arabia, where you've got various types of oligopoly managing resources and production uh, technologically, trying to rationalize their system in that way by control of industrial processes, like very much akin to what Burnham said in the managerial revolution. So you have a kind of classical managerialism in the BRICS group. It's not going to liberate you. They're not going to save you. They are managerialists. And to a degree, they are, they are technocratic as well. Mm. They are technocratic in practice, but not so much inspired by the technocracy of the West, because the technocracy of the West is more of an ideology. What it is, is it's an attempt to colonize your mind. And the reason for this is, is because in the, in the BRICS countries, you can see the overt use of force has been a function of political power historically. You know, in China under Maoism, the 100 million or more victims of communism, which were reduced by Eric Hobsbawm, who was himself a Marxist, he said that the 20th century saw, saw the destruction of more than 100 million souls. And this is from a left-wing historian. That was due to communism. So it's been overtly violent. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, last week I read news of a, of a Saudi Arabian teacher who is facing the death penalty for making some remarks on um, Twitter. So, you know, the use of violence is overt there. The idea that, um, well, the difference between us and them, as it were, between our managerialism and theirs, is that people are controlled here by propaganda. Their minds are shaped, mm -hmm. their opinions manufactured. That's what happens. So we have replaced force with, the, if you like, if you want to be generous, persuasion. The power of behavioural modification through propaganda was mastered during World War II by Edward Bernays, who literally wrote the book on the subject. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our taste formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Their own personal bias and agenda control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. The introduction of the human mind into the market, it's, it, it's become a product. The product is you and uh, te technocratic managerialism. And how is this achieved nowadays? It's being advanced by technology. The reason why these fantasists have so much belief in it is because if you look at the degree to which mass society is now dependent upon screen-based interaction, I mean, we're on one at the moment, but when you interact with your social media platform, what you're interacting with is, is an algorithm. And the algorithm has been originally produced by a data set that people volunteered to Facebook. Facebook itself was a continuation of the National Security Agency's LifeLog project, which was coincidentally cancelled on the same day 
that Facebook was launched. Former director of LifeLog actually uh, admitted this to Vice magazine a few years after it happened. So the NSA was criticised for trying to produce a total information awareness programme which, which collected every piece of data about everyone's lives. It caused scandal in the Senate and Congress. So what they decided to do instead was to make it voluntary. Instead of, instead of going out and drawing the information from people in a semi-legal process that terrified uh, you know, political accountability, they invented Facebook and so people volunte voluntarily gave the most private and intimate details of all their lives to a mass surveillance machine. Now, every single system online, including Twitter and Google and Facebook, they're all scraping your data to produce superior artificial intelligence models. I've argued myself that Elon Musk's relative free speech policy, which obviously has its limitations, is simply a means of creating a richer data set to build a better artificial intelligence language learning model. That's what it is. That's, that's the only argument that satisfies me as to why it's what he's doing. Because he's behind on that, he's got better real-life AI with Tesla cars, but he doesn't have a better language learning model. So he wants to overtake, um, shall we say, chat LGBT by having a richer input. And he will have a richer input, and it probably will help. So basically, big data is, is collecting information about human behavior. It creates algorithms which then shape your online experience. So initially, in the early years of Facebook, you, your experience online would have been shaped by human input, but now it isn't. That human input is vanishing into the past. And what you are being shaped by now is billions and billions of correspondences between machine-generated informational points. So your world and your personality and your emotions and your dopamine rewards are increasingly patterned upon, the, as it were, the thoughts of a machine. And I, Frank, I don't know if you've noticed this, but what happens when you get a notification on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn? What is the symbol of that notification? Um, I don't know, a little red thing or a, a, a thumbs up or... Well, it's, it's, it's on all those platforms, it's a bell. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, I didn't notice that. I'm salivating now. <laughs> which is interesting when you understand behaviorism that came out of Pavlov and, and Skinner. So yeah. it's it's right there in your face. Your bell is ringing and you're salivating <laughs> and you're being so engineered. You are making basic observations about reality and this makes you a dangerous paranoid conspiracy theorist. <laughs> the, the, the Skinnerian idea of operant conditioning is obvious. Like Operant conditioning is basically the architecture of addictive online gaming. Uh, and, and, you know, people call it gamification because it sounds nice, but the gamification of social interaction through social media, what that means is, is like you said, is that you produce real life, sorry, real neurochemical rewards for virtual events. Mm -hmm. So people's, people's internal chemistry is becoming patterned and calibrated to the behavior of, 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 of digitized systems. Skinner's social engineering techniques of operant or environmental conditioning can be seen in many forms today. Cake and brief counseling will be available at the conclusion of the test. So the loot lottery is kind of a system by which random items are generated. And the best analogy is it's a slot machine. Every time you kill a monster, you put a quarter into the slot machine and you pull the lever and out can come nothing. You get your quarterback, you know, you could do pretty well or you could hit a jackpot. And so if you can think of pulling the lever as every time you kill a monster, it's got kind of this addictive quality. Just as, as slot machines are addictive, so is the I am going to maybe win something big here. The pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behavior of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered. Or in Skinner's terms, what was the schedule of reinforcement? The main thing is what, what we call schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is what the layman calls reward, and you can schedule it uh, so that a reward occurs every now and then when a pigeon does something. We usually use a response with a pigeon pecking a little disc, a little spot in the wall, and you can reinforce with food. But you don't reinforce every time, you're every, perhaps every tenth time, or perhaps only once every minute or something like that. There are a very large number of, of schedules, 
and they have their uh, special effects. And there is a good example of how you can move from uh, the, uh, the pigeon to the human case, because one of the, one of the schedules which is very effective with, with rats for pigeons is what we call the variable ratio schedule, and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect. How much of the self resides within the self nowadays? And how much is, it belongs to what you might call the cloud? The mm -hmm. machine, more properly, the machine. How much of you belongs to the machine? How much of your internal architecture is prompted by the machine? How much of you is you? You know, it's, it's a good question, and it's one that's worth answering. And obviously, it doesn't, it doesn't make you better. One of, one of the more interesting ideas that are around today is the idea of scale. The idea that the mass scale of society itself is a pathologizing process because it uses things like Skinnerianism to reduce people to basic operant conditioning you know, to ringing and reward. When the bell rings, I salivate. Now, at first, the dog salivates because it gets the reward of its dinner. But gradually, the dinner is removed and only the bell remains. This is very much like what happens on social media because the, the reward is the bell. Mm -hmm. there, there isn't anything to eat. The, you know, it is, it is a reward for a product that you've consumed that doesn't exist. And that can be applied equally to the post-human utopia that we're, that we're suggested to have. Now, the mass society that we're in is this, this technological dimension of the mass society is one aspect in which it is a, is a vast pathologizing machine. There's also another bloke called J.B. Calhoun who wrote about like mouse utopias and so on. Yep, Universe 25. And yes. Well, the thing is, is that <clears throat> what his argument was, was that the concentration of people into urban bug hives, which is very much uh, adduced by the Net Zero and Agenda 2030 program, we were all supposed to live in tiny pods and huge urban conurbations. He said that this simple concentration of human population led to pathological behaviour. And that, I think that this is one dimension of the aspect of mass society that makes people sick. One thing that's completely unignorable is that mass society, mass technocratic consumer culture, is making people obese, mentally ill. It actually rewards mental illness. Uh, and I will adduce that right now. I'm about to become serious and completely invincible intellectually by the simple means. Now, once, I'm, once a man wears a wig, it's impossible to criticise him. It, it's actually a criminal offence to, to insult me now. So I'll take it off so I'm vulnerable again. <laughs> it's your shield. Well, it is. It is. But it's a, it's a great... It's a, it's, no, it's a great career move. It makes you invincible. If, if your life is a failure, then simply wear a wig all the time uh, and call yourself Jenna. But the thing is, what I'm going on about is that mass society not, not only promotes these pathological behaviours, but it actually does reward them. And you can, you can, agree, you can achieve a degree of legal privilege and, and advantage. You can be preferred for a position at work. You are preferred. Competence is disadvantaged by this. Whether or not you agree with people, um, with female impersonators, or the idea that your skin colour means that you should be privileged to a position of power, whether or not you agree with that in principle, it's impossible to countermand the fact. And the fact is, is that this disadvantages competence. It actually weakens organisations because instead of ability, you simply have superficial characteristics. Now, this, this is, these superficial characteristics lead to your promotion under ESG rules, which now uh, govern the profitability of companies. So environmental and social governance rules as set, set out by the powerful company BlackRock and promoted by them in all the companies that it commands, uh, which is most of them in the world. So if you don't satisfy these conditions, you don't get your funding. And what that means is that you, you are obliged to promote people for reasons other than competence. Mm -hmm. Now, this is patently insane. Now, th th this, is, this is an aspect of the technocratic society that is obviously insane. It says it doesn't matter how capable you are if you do not wear a wig or if, you are, if you're the wrong colour, then you're not getting the job. You know, we want people who are this colour now, and we want people who wave these flags. And it doesn't matter whether they can do the job at all. Now, this is, if you like, the extreme pathology of the managerial idea that human beings, once trained in managerialism, are fungible. What managerialism wants, the reason why your boss does talk like a beep boop, do not recognise human input error, is because what managerialism selects for is components. Hmm. Character is actually... Uh, deleterious to managerialism, it's inefficient to have people of principle or indeed of, of, of high intellect. So it wants moderately capable people who are compliant. And also it, it seeks to replace, not just in the workplace, but everywhere else, human relations 
with human transactions. It is a transactional and not relational model. This is a pathological model because transactions, like business transactions, like customer service relations, they are, they are deliberately exclusive of the human dimension that makes for relational experience, for a rewarding experience of life, for sincerity, and for all the human qualities that we try, that we treasure and prize and that we wish to foster in our children and that we see as the hallmark of a healthy existence. That's what this customer service model of reality excludes. That's the goal of technocratic managerialism to reduce us to a series of transactions. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, if you gradually eliminate the capacity for beauty and for truth and for the value of life and for the recognition of the divine, then you won't notice it when it's gone, will you? Because I believe that all these functions that give mankind a higher spiritual purpose, then that everything that is true in beauty does eventually indicate God. This is what elevates mankind. This is what seeks us to look beyond ourselves into something better. But it seeks us to strive to become, as I like to call it, not perfect, but less bad. If you eliminate these things, then there simply isn't anything to do other than to consume. And other people are simply impediments to your consumption. Well, in, in business, you often hear customers described as consumers, which is a, a term I loathe because it, it, it exactly is it, it's birthed in all of the principles which you have just outlined. And you're completely correct. It really is about reducing human ontology to a point where we're simply beasts that can be controlled like in a, in a cattle ranch somewhere. You know, St. James says in his epistle that every beast has been tamed, but no one can tame the tongue. So beasts can be tamed. So in order to tame humans, because we're fundamentally not beasts, we're Imago Dei, to control and tame humans, you must make them bestial. You have to reduce their morals. You have to bring them down. You have to demoralize them. It, we're seeing it manifest in society, as you said, with the promotion of the inversion of morality. I mean, that, this is oh, all yeah. part of the, the agenda to control people, control human behavior. And as, as you've mentioned before, to make people more easily manageable within this system. Well, I'm going to put on the intellectual spectacles now. <clears throat> and I'd like to point out that there isn't any glass in them. Look, there we are. They're, they're purely for effect. Yeah? But when I wear these, yeah, they ain't clever me. Okay, and I'm going to look over them disapprovingly. I'm not looking disapprovingly at you, but at society. right? And I'm going to talk about moral inversion. Now, <clears throat> Polanyi's idea of moral inversion has two dimensions, right? I'm going to take the spectacles off because they're simply too overpowering. Yeah. Okay, I'm a, I'm a normal person again now. So the, <laughs> I'm no longer an intellectual. <laughs> There's no need to shoot me in a rice field. The, uh, well, there are reasons to shoot me in a rice field, but not that one. But the, uh, the, the thing is, is that Polanyi's idea of moral inversion is, is an interesting one because not only does it say, look, vice is, uh, is, is promoted as virtue, which it is. I mean, the seven deadly sins nowadays. You basically see advertisements for them on the tube, celebrating them. You know, I mean, like if you're if you're a kind of sexually moderate glutton, then you're vaunted as some kind of new model for humanity. Now, mm -hmm. aside from that, aside from the fact that that giving yourself to immediate and permanent uh, delimited desire, which doesn't liberate you but enslaves you eventually, even the Marxists uh, of the Frankfurt School noticed this. I mean, um, Herbert Marcuse, in his One Dimensional Man, mentioned what he called repressive desublimation. But he said that, you know, what, what consumer capitalism does, and again, this is a man from the Frankfurt School who would be completely unacceptable to the lefties nowadays. He said what consumer capitalism does in offering you what uh, this, this endless uh, satisfaction of choices is that it just represses you. It just isolates you in a world of false desires. Right? And he called it repressive desublimation. The desublimation bit is the, is the liberation of you from any form of moral prohibition and the satisfaction of your desires. So that, that's the removal of restraint for what you want. And the repressive bit is, once your face is in the trough, it never looks up. Mm -hmm. And you just get fatter and die. And that is, in fact, what is happening. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. So moral inversion has that, has that property yes. of making everything that's bad for you good. But it also, Polanyi said also, moral inversion inspires people with a kind of nihilistic fervor. Now, this is the interesting bit psychologically. Why do people go mad over the current thing? Why one minute are they wearing oddly pointed pink hats and the next waving Ukrainian flags? And then the next they're putting their fists in the air for a, a, you know, a man who died of a drug overdose after committing crimes. Why, why do these fervors, why do these manias take hold so easily? Polanyi said that under a system of moral inversion, 
where there is no wider moral framework to explain human activity or moral reasoning, people will attach intense personal feeling to meaningless events. They are, they are seeking constantly to infuse some event with intense moral significance. And so this is the reason why you see periodic phases of societal madness, or what you might call mass formation psychosis, which was how the, the lockdown scenario was described, famously or infamously, depending on whether you agreed with it. But the periodic expression of, of mass mania is related to moral inversion. Because once you remove any wider moral framework, people still have a need to attach moral valuing to things. And because they can't routinely locate those moral values, it becomes an intense need. And this is why these, these movements, despite being based on fantasy, or in fact, it's sometimes being the opposite of reality. You know, for example, the lockdown regime was basically a regime of enforced uh, solitary confinement which is defined as a means of torture under the Geneva Convention. This was mm. promoted as a public good. It is the opposite of the truth. I mean, it doesn't matter whether these things are true. These are myths. Myths cannot be refuted. And once you combine mythology, these popular myths that are promoted through the media, with an intense appetite for moral significance, you get this furious, nihilistic, emotional response where... For one point, there's a brilliant phosphorescent mania about one particular event that on examination has no logical basis. And in fact, it's, its purported celebration contradicts its own terms. So this is another example of, of the paradox into which enlightenment reason leads people. It deprives them of the ability to reason correctly about moral events and therefore leads them into mass hysteria as well as being susceptible to the fantasies offered by the de-restriction of desire. These are processes that are part of, but not necessarily exclusively of, the technocratic managerial society you have. These are processes that are useful to it. Yes. But, but the idea that, 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 that we can achieve some kind of liberation through technology is itself a fantasy, and it cannot be stressed enough. Again, Kaczynski described these people uh, as belonging to a sort of cult called technianity. He talked about Ray Kurzweil's um, singularity. Kurzweil famously said that there was, and still believes, that there are several means by which technology can confer immortality. One is the uploading of consciousness into the cloud. Another is promoted by the historian and not a man with any technological background himself, Yuval Noah Harari, who often gets a, an enormously popular platform, a very widespread hearing for a man with no real schooling in, in the things he's talking about for the idea that there's some kind of like human machine fusion coming which i mean i've spoken to specialists in the area of transcranial stimulation the idea that you can put mfri resonant technology as an interface to the human brain and they've said that all this is going to result in is more dead monkeys it, it, it's impossible so these are fantasies like the people who are guiding the project of technological society to a technocracy that is somehow perfectible and that can, remove, that can remove human error from the system of humanity. These are people who are inspired by fantasies. They themselves are selling a product to themselves that does not exist. They wish it did, but it doesn't. And in the process, things are falling apart. And there's a logical connection there when you adopt their worldview. If you are simply a meat machine, a, just a, a compound of biology, well, then it makes sense that from a, a meat machine, you can just transfer the software to a metal machine. So I, I, you understand the thought process, even though it's the premise is, is fundamentally wrong because we are, as you, as you said earlier, creating the image of God. This is God's world, this is reality. Frank, what is your, your, where is this all heading? Where, what is your view of eschatology and times? Because the Bible has quite a great deal to say about the, the last days before the return of Christ. I'm interested, interested to know what are your thoughts and do you see things in our current environment sort of teeing things up for the return of Christ? I am very much persuaded of the limits of my own knowledge, right? I, I basically, what I'm saying is, is that I know that I'm ignorant. And, uh, <laughs> I think it's important to remember that you, you cannot know everything. And these, these people who are inspired by machinery, it, that's the Faustian dream that, that by some devilish pact, 
you can exceed yourself forever and everyone else. There's a certain narcissism to this. Let's not forget there's a certain vanity to it. That's why I mentioned the idea of death being intolerable to people because no one will be there to curate their Instagram posts. It's because it's because their own idea of themselves will die. I mean, that's intolerable to them. It's not that they value life. It's that, that no one will look at them anymore. Yeah. And they won't be able to see people looking at them. You know, this, this is the degradation of the classical thymotic impulse that motivated the, the magnification of the spirit of Achilles and Odysseus. Instead of heroism nowadays, all we have is look at me for no other reason than I wish to be noticed. So eschatology is a powerful notion for, if you like, the post-Christian or the atheist. These things are eschatological. The eschaton that is imagined by the technological revolution, as it were, the fourth industrial revolution, the technocratic dream, this is an eschatology. They are promising you a paradise that makes sense only to Instagram addicted bugmen who like to eat uh, soy replacement foods so that they can't hurt themselves because they're so degraded and they need a special tool to do it. This, they have a fascination for this tool, the same fascination that the chimp does for a bow that he uses to smash open a coconut. They fetishize the technology that they have to resort to because of their own moral and physical enfeeblement. So the eschatology is the liberation from themselves that has been ruined by their own ideals. It's oddly enough, that's the case. That's the paradox, right? The desperate situation that we inhabit ontologically, you know, the degradation of the human experience, the degradation of social reality is itself, by coincidence, a compelling argument for the complete removal of this system of humanity and social organization and its replacement by the patterning on a machine. That is the eschatology of the godless, is that we can replace God and humanity with technology. Now, as for my ideas about the return of Christ, well, I cannot speak to it. I would say that I, I acknowledge the limits of my own reason and that there are things I cannot understand. And I, I firmly believe that God will make himself known when he sees fit. I, 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 cannot, I, I, I cannot see the merit in my, my own. Maybe some other people do have merit in this area. I'm not saying there can't be merit in it. But for me to speak about these matters would be akin to the actions of a house specs. I am not about to go outside and disembowel a lamb and check its liver to read the future. Right? I, I, I cannot speak to that. Uh, it, it, but I do firmly believe that the Lord has told us that Christ wins in the end. And that he will. And that the, the, the ultimate message for people who are wondering why are these things a mess? It's because it's because we have it's not just because we have strayed from God. It's because we, we are still seduced by the ultimate satanic vanity that mankind can be not only the instrument of his own liberation or of his own emancipation, but that mankind can be the instrument of his own salvation. And as with all the other religions of mankind, such as communism and fascism, liberalism is descending into a barbarism that has been unexampled in history. Each form of, of, of the religion of mankind results in a worse barbarism than the previous one. And the barbarization that we're undergoing now is one that's described as progress and liberation. But in fact, it is the annihilation of everything of value in life, including the valuing of human life itself, which is seen as imperfect, a kind of a kind of crooked timber that can be planed straight by machines. But in the process, this perfect, this perfect shining object that results from machine-like processes can no longer be described as humanity. Secondly, one thing that Kaczynski says in his book, which is remarkable, and very few people actually mention this, is the question of whether mass society is, is at all dirigible. Can these people who seek to control everything can they have any reasonable hope of total control? I would argue that they can't, and this is why they place so much faith in technology. The idea to remove the human from the human system is, is to solve this problem that mass society, or indeed any society, is, has never proven dirigible by, by one person or a politburo or an elite of any kind. There are simply too many competing interests and, so, and, and too many competitive forces counterforces, not just ideologies, but limits, human limitations, resource limitations. This is the reason why you see that the project of what you might call the technocratic machine is to eliminate everything that isn't itself. But it, unless it is completely mechanized, it always adds an element of chaos. What it's producing now 
is paradoxically chaotic. We have less order in our societies now than we did 20 years ago. We have less freedom, we have less liberty, and we have internalised an almost um, paranoid idea of policing that is akin to the dictatorships of the Soviet Union. And not only do we police our own speech and our own thoughts in danger of losing our livelihood or being harassed by blue-haired fanatics in the street. <laughs> I mean, that day's coming for me. I personally wear large leather boots because I read uh, the diaries of Valam Shalamov, who was sent to the Gulag in Kolyma for many years. And he said that boiling down your leather boots gave you the ability to make a, a palatable soup on which you might be able to survive when you're imprisoned in the Gulag. So uh, that's, that's what I think about. But the fact is, is that we've not only internalised these authoritarian processes, but we've, we've, we've come to a point where the basic practice of human instinct is becoming coded negatively, that, that, that human input is no longer recognised as valid. It, it, if, if you object to the inhumanity of your treatment, to your laws, to your system, to the obvious insanity and chaos that they're producing, these are coded as invalid. Your human input is a violation of the terms and conditions of reality. That is the summary of uh, hate speech laws and of protocols that govern corporate speak and of everything that, that, that corrals you into a machine-like interpretation of a reality that doesn't exist. Because in case you haven't noticed, your lived experience, as they like to say, is not reflected in the mass media machine. You never see your own predicament. You never see potholed roads in the adverts. You, you, you don't see institutional rot displayed on television. Mm -hmm. The only place where Western society functions normally is in Netflix series. I'd like to end just by reading Psalm 4. I read it this morning, and I think it will um, actually be its quite pertinent to our discussion. I will put it out here. And then maybe afterwards, you could just tell folks how they can support you, how they can uh, keep on top of things that you're doing. But let me just read Psalm 4, and then I'll, I'll leave the floor to you. And you can mention anything else you, you'd like uh, before we close here. So Psalm 4 says, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone. O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Especially the, the last sentence there. You alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And that's something we have to meditate on as we see uh, this darkness sort of just encroaching society is that God alone is our salvation. And if our hope is in our intellect, our abilities, our finances, then we're ultimately idolaters. That's what I believe. I think ultimately we have to hold on to only God can deliver us and, and he will deliver us because he has promised to do so. So um, that's that's how I like to just uh, remind people of that as um, as these things unfold. But I'll leave the floor to you, Frank. Feel free to mention how people can contact you, uh, support you and anything else that you're currently working on. The so-called clever people of our times tell us that God is a superstition. Only stupid people believe in the man in the sky. It's ridiculous. It's a relic of history. It's, it's something that we can get beyond because we have technology and uh, mobile phones now. And uh, you can become a woman just by saying so. We've, we've, we've progressed far beyond superstition. Uh, but in fact, the belief that mankind, the belief in mankind is, is a far more dubious suspicion than the belief in God. It is far more absurd. To believe in mankind and it is in God. Just look at mankind's questionable track record for an indication of how his reason is seldom related to his actions. Man cannot be the instrument of his own salvation. Not only that, not only is, is Christianity the basis of Western civilization, it doesn't just leave us with a relict of, uh, of justice and moral reasoning. It has been the light that has guided the world. And it, and, it, and it could do so again by a restoration of the correct attitude in belief. We cannot continue in the misguided perception that, or, or the misguided ideology that machinery is some kind of replacement for God. If you read the work of John Gray, who is himself an agnostic, 
it's, he points out the basic fundamental flaw in what you might call the new atheism, which is that it mistakes the belief in God for an attempt to compete with scientific understanding. The idea that science and God are in some kind of competition isn't a religious idea. It's, it's an idea that's upheld by the technocrats, by the techies, by people who believe that technology is a replacement for God. These two, these two strands are not in competition. These two strands of, of the dimension of life, the divine and the technological, are not in competition. It is people who wish to supplant the Lord and replace him with machines that see it as a contest. It's a contest they're determined to win, but the evidence is around us that it's not one that they can. This attempt is doomed. And even people who do not believe, who have no religious belief whatsoever, can see the evidence of its actions around them in mass scale pathological behavior, in the use of antidepressants, drugs legal and illegal, in the obesity epidemic, in the collapse of, of, of why, in the collapse of social order and moral order. They wonder why their children of five years old have to read graphically sexually explicit books in nurseries. These, these are questions that don't have an answer because they're inspired by a myth. And that myth is the myth of progress. And this, this myth is the myth with which we've replaced the belief in God. This is the simple message that I have to people who wonder what to say to people who call them stupid for believing in God, is that it is more absurd to not believe in God because look at what they've replaced him with. If you want to fund my eventual journey into the Gulag, where I will be compelled to boil down my own shoes and pluck off the occasional pine kernel for a bit of vitamin C, if you'd like to, if you'd like to uh, expedite my journey into a slow and painful death in a labour camp, then you can find me at Substack, which is frankright.substack.com. I'm also uh, surprisingly not permanently banned from the platform known as Twitter, where I occasionally post career ending memes and uh, political and social insights into the ongoing collapse of our civilization. So you can find me there as well. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll happily respond to any inquiries you have. Um, I've got an email address, which is frankwriter with a G at pm.me if you'd like to get in touch. God bless you.